welcome to Frisella's All Around the Yard. I am your host, Tony Frisella Jr., and I am very, 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 very excited uh, for the conversation today because this is something that's right up my alley with health. Uh, and I think this is a subject that most people still aren't aware enough of. And so with me today, I have Emily Hudson, who is a naturopathic doctor. Emily, thank you for joining me today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. So uh, Emily and I talked a little bit before that, just before we got on here, start recording, and we're both very excited for the conversation. So um, I'm going to let her, Emily, why don't you go ahead and give a little bit of background just you know, from uh, academics and your experience, and, and then we'll, we'll get into some, some uh, conversation here. Sure. Uh, okay, so about me, I am originally from St. Louis, um, which is, I think, really important to know because oftentimes I get the question of, why are you back here as a naturopathic doctor? Um, uh, because I get that question a lot because naturopathic doctors are not licensed here in the state of Missouri. So it's a difficult place to practice naturopathic medicine, but I'm from here and I love it here so much. And I wanted to bring this amazing medicine um, back to my home and help the people in my community. So um, from St. Louis, I went to Mizzou for undergrad um, I'm a respiratory therapist by trade there. I worked at Barnes Jewish Hospital for three years in some pretty intense situations, the ER, the ICU. So I've got a pretty strong conventional medical understanding and background uh, as well that really drove me to um, want to seek out what else there was out there. So I saw the beauty and the, the, the wonder of conventional medicine and what it could do, but I also saw the limitations. And so I uh, decided to pursue my career as a naturopathic doctor. And I decided to travel to Seattle, Washington to do so because it was one of the accredited universities in North America that I thought at the time was the best one. And so that's where I went. And I was there for about seven years and I got my doctorate in naturopathic medicine. And at the same time I was doing that, I decided to get my master's in counseling psychology. I didn't plan on doing that when I first went, but I saw, uh, again, I just sort of allowed organically to like, you know, what am I supposed to do with this? Uh, and, and I saw the great benefit and the great need for mental health integration more deeply and uh, fully um, in, in the field of medicine and just, uh, you know, not being limited to um, those that were, you know, really severe, but, you know, just the idea that all of us have a, a component of mental health um, as a part of our, of our whole health, of our holistic health. So anyway, that just really called to me and I integrated that. I got both of those degrees in the span of five years. And then I pretty much packed up and came back here to St. Louis and opened up a practice. And I've been in um, a sole, I've been a sole practitioner at my clinic for uh, a, about three years as well. So um, February of 2018 is when I opened and, yeah, so and I, I'm still I, here. So it's, yeah, so like I said, I, I'm excited to give this conversation because um, I mean, with everything that you just covered, I mean, there's a lot that I think you know, you know, I talked beforehand that, you know, our business and gardening and landscaping, I, I am convinced and I always have been convinced since I was, you know, I'm going to say younger, but I was in my early 20s. That's yeah. something that most people, most men in their 20s think about, but like, I know what we're, what we're providing people mm. and more than just a pretty plant. It's, you know, it's an escape. It's a, it's oh, some kind yeah. of, it's just some kind of, uh, you know, getaway. But yeah. uh, so with, what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, well, first part of this will focus more on uh, natural medicine and plants. Sure. And then we might divvy off into some other ends toward, towards the last half. Um, so for a plant focused standpoint, what is your experience or do you have any experience with, you know, what, maybe it's specific herbs or plants that people typically grow at yeah. their homes that they might not know or have all these amazing <laughs> I'll give you an example. Like I know dandelions. I haven't eaten dandelion, but I know that there's a lot of good natural properties to dandelions. Yeah. So 
I mean, so what 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 kind of experience do you have with with that? What 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 would you be able to give shed some light on? Oh my gosh, so much experience. This is what you're going to have to cut me off on. <laughs> um, I mean, I could go on and on give about me, dance. Give me, give me give me three or four. Give me three or four. Let's start with three or four if you can. <sighs> Let's see. Okay, so you know, I, I so you already know about me that I love all things uh, mental health and mm-hmm. just um, how you know big picture that is for everybody's health. So I I actually think that there's a lot of plants that are easily grown, that are um, extremely useful to our mental health. It just seems like those, the, that realm of things, uh, it's just easier to grow. So we think of, um, you know, families of plants. So like the, the, the family uh, of um, Lamiaceae is, mm-hmm. is filled with things like lemon balm and other mints. Um, even lavender, you know, is in that family. Mm-hmm. Um, And so those things are pretty well known and very easy to grow as things that can be not only, you know, utilized for their smell and their, their volatile oils that, you know, create such a strong smell, even like, even just walking. Yes. I mean, even just walking by a lemon balm, um, AKA Melissa officinalis plant, you're like, oh what is like, are there lemons around here somewhere? Like what is going on? And then you look down at your feet and there's just some weeds growing, you know, in a garden Mm -hmm. of lemon balm. Um, And, you know, you can, you can pick these things. You can, you can put them in, you can dry them if you want. You could put them in teas. Like I'm willing to talk about all the different ways we can use, you know, medicinal plants if we go there. Um, But, you know, other things. This is is as much information as we want to drop. And this is where, (laughs) <laughs> and let's, let's think about like so like uh i'm gonna i'm gonna use one of my one of my associates terminology if uh you know aunt may is, has her has her pots mm-hmm. out on the uh yeah. out on, the, on the porch yeah and she puts herbs in them you know yeah. it, there's a lot of people are putting them just because that's what people do not yeah. really using them to the fullest extent so right. i guess uh with yeah the, with there's a lot of things you can do for like cooking, you know, but beyond, beyond that, um, like, I, you know, uh, rosemary is another really good one for cooking, but also for mental health and, um, you know, things like blue vervain are really beautiful and things that you can grow and then utilize. Um, chamomile is a really common one and something that's super easy just to pick those little flower buds off the top when they bloom and put in some tea um, you know, echinacea, which is just such a beautiful Missouri native flower. Um, you know, so these are the things, these are the things I think of. There's so, I mean, there's so many herbs and so many plants, but, um, they're not all very easily utilized for medicine. You know, some you need the roots of, and some you need, you know, the, the baby forms of, and so you like just certain times of the year. So all of the ones that I've mentioned so far, are pretty accessible and um, more easily, you know, utilized. And that's why those culinary herbs, um, you know, should be, we should expand our understanding of these culinary herbs because not only do they taste good in food um, and, you know, help the, the, the taste of food, but they can also be used medicinally as well. Well, also got two questions for you. One, for something like uh, echinacea, Mm-hmm. I grew up taking echinacea when I was sick and before, if I felt like I was getting a cold coming on, I would always take, I'd always have a little capsule of echinacea or actually when I was younger, my parents used to put it in orange juice and mix it up with some vitamin C. Uh, right. That was, that would be my, that would be. That oh would yeah. Be but I mean, how much. <laughs> you had a hippie so, house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so with, um, uh, with, 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 with echinacea, how much yeah. would somebody, like, how would people go about Mm -hmm. uh harvesting it and how much of it would actually take to get a meaningful amount or would it be something that they more just you know kind of smatter in a salad or would they cook with it or would they you know those kind of things and and i'm not a chef by any means so i can make a (laughs) mean salad but that's about it (laughs) yeah so um you know the aerial parts of echinacea echinacea is one of those that can you know you can use like all of the different parts. And there's so many studies on echinacea that, you know, you could really just dive into um, which, you know, which species and what type of, you know, what type of flower specifically, and then what part of it should be used. Um, I've, I've never personally used that one um, myself, like from my own garden, but you, 
you certainly could if you wanted. And then the best way I think for that one would either be um, in a tincture form. So I'm happy to talk about like how, how to do that. Um, you know, you would that basically what it is, is an extraction in alcohol. So uh, like a tea, for example, you extract the constituents of the herbs in water. You just let them sit in water and the, the water just sort of slowly pulls out those constituents that are medicinal, mm -hmm. but in a tincture or liquid extract, you would use alcohol and let the herbs or, or roots or whatever they are sit in that alcohol for a long period of time. And then um, it would more completely pull out those, yeah. those pieces that you're really wanting medicinally. And there's lots of great books, you know, um, you know, just how to get started with backyard herbalism you know, that it's just so easy. Once, once you have the materials and actually, you know, are, are moving into that world, it just, it becomes so easy and you can make your own medicine. And I think that's even more powerful sometimes than, you know, buying it off the shelves. Although that's a very easy way to do it. And I do that yeah. quite often. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, well, there's a convenience factor to it as well. Yeah. But at, at the same, at the same time, what's really, but, you know, as we're talking though, I'm sure there's a lot of dangerous stuff out there that you want to be careful with, but mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the grand scheme of things, you know, coneflower, echinacea, lemon balm. I mean, like this is very. Yeah. So anything that I, anything that I name for you in today's yeah. episode is going to be, you know, generally safe or, yeah. or just safe, you know? Um, and then if there's anything not safe, I'll let you know, but really, I guess this is sort of a, 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 an announcement you know a yeah. PSA it's like yes you're totally right natural stuff herbs you know there are some really dangerous things out there and you want to just be really careful that um, whether it's in your own backyard or taking them you know off the shelf you know you got to really know what you're doing sometimes so any of the ones that I mentioned today are you know pretty safe so I, I, I I like so I have my gardens I'm Italian so I, it's kind of cliche we always have our gardens and I wish I could keep up with them more but <laughs> you know and I and I love the fact that my kids go out and you know pull the uh, vegetables out and pick the blackberries and the raspberries right. and all that. I mean it's oh yeah and they love the experience of it they love planting the seeds uh they haven't gotten the part of weeding yet but uh <laughs> uh but I mean I one thing I would love to get to kind of next level of it all, because we talk a lot about gardening on, on this on this show, is I would like to try uh, to find a couple herbs and, and play mm. around with them and just and just see, you know, do I notice yes. a difference and what are my goals and those yes. kind of things. So I want to try X, Y, and Z. Okay, well, what herbs are for that? Okay, maybe I try to do a couple of these perennials or herbs that are out there and and play with it. So that's definitely something that is a, is a huge interest interest to me. I guess oh, if yeah. somebody was starting. Mm -hmm. what, what would it, what, what would you say would be kind of like a general purpose herb that would be good to start with? Mm. Something, something like lemon, lemon balm or? Yeah, you know, I'm trying to think of, you know, something that, that maybe is a bit more all purpose, like you're saying, um, you know, holy basil is a really good one. Um, it's what we call an adaptogen. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's, it's, pretty easy to grow and you don't, it's not the roots that you need. And so you could easily just pick off the leaves and dry them and use them medicinally. So I would say as if we're, if we're moving sort of away from like purely mental health and more into the realm of all purpose, like something that someone could harvest themselves and utilize on a daily basis for just overall health um, as an adaptogen and I'm happy to you know talk more about what that word means um yeah well, but why, don't you, why don't you why don't you explain why don't you explain that yeah because before I started reading uh Greenfield's book I, I had no idea what that meant so, yeah so I, you know it's this very herbalist term um and so it it it, it, it it's the word adaptogen is there because it helps this is something that helps us adapt to stress right and so um I could I could go on about this, but uh, basically our, um, our body can handle stress pretty well, right? Like, you know, we can, as humans undergo quite a lot of stress, uh, everyday stress ups and downs, you know, but there kind of comes a point where, you know, one more drop in the bucket and, and we sort of um, <laughs> overflow. And that may look like a chronic illness to somebody that may look like a panic attack to somebody that may look like, um, you know, uh, oh, that triggers a migraine for somebody, you know, it could be anything. 
Um, and, and that's sort of what I aim to do as a naturopathic doctor is figure out what these different barometers are for people and where it's coming from. So anyway, when our body is um, uh, exposed to chronic stress, you know, our adrenal glands and, you know, other parts of our bodies tend to overwork mm -hmm. and, and, and get overtaxed. And so an adaptogen can kind of come in and help to do whatever that gland is really needing in that moment. And that's the beauty of an adaptogen is it doesn't only increase the output of cortisol when it needs to be, but it can also decrease the output of cortisol when it needs to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really the kind of the magic, I believe, like and beauty and um, just amazing nature of herbs, especially adaptogenic herbs. And there's a lot of really beautiful adaptogen herbs. And I think holy basil would maybe be one of the easiest um, to grow. And it tastes so good. Huh. So, and, and I guess, uh, have you, where would you, would you put that in a salad? Would you put that like, as a garnish in the side of a meat? I mean, what, what would you, what, how would you? Uh, how would you... Tea, I would tea? say yeah. is tea uh, would be a, my, my main use for holy basil. Um, and then you could also like, again, tincture, encapsulate it, but it's a really delicious herb. And so we want to really take advantage of the taste of herbs um, when we're making a tea, because you don't really want to make a tea of like gross stuff, you know, yeah, and yeah. there's a lot of <laughs> herbs that just honestly taste really gross, but they've got amazing let, medicinal properties. So I would say me, a tea. Let me ask you this question real fast. Um, so there's, there's a honey that comes from Australia Mm. that's supposed to be i asked i don't know if you know I, I just 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 something that kind of tangent in my head but there's something like a certain clover or a certain uh, uh something over there that the bees use in the honey the pollen yeah. and it's supposed to be highly uh, potent in antioxidants uh -huh. the stuff is supposed to be is, is, is i haven't seen it but i've seen the pricing on it. it's ridiculously expensive to go over. I don't, do you know anything about about that honey are you talking i don't know are you talking about manuka honey I think that's it. I think that's it. I think that's okay. it. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's super popular. I do use it sometimes. I've used it in the past a lot for like wound healing, okay. uh, you know, um, on the skin, um, uh -huh. just for, for difficult to treat. Um, yeah. Spa, uh, you know, anti, anti antibacterial, antiviral, um, honey can be so, so amazing. It's sort of like using plants indirectly, you know, you can expose yourself to allergens, uh, by using local honey and actually help with, um, seasonal allergies, but it has to be local honey because of, uh, you want the yeah. bees to have picked up pollen from actual plants in your area. So and I've heard that yeah, honey is such too. a great I, way. I've heard that too. And I've, I, I know that's something that a lot of people don't, there's just, there's these simple things that right. get overlooked you know it's it's like you know we try to fix a problem it's not you don't take the motor out of a car because it won't start you start right. with okay test the battery you test these little things before you go into these bigger uh methods of trying to you know get through whatever ailment you've got going on and i i, I just again right. why, why i love why i love the why i love the subject too yeah um, now, something something that i made a note she way kind of several comments back um <laughs> Part of this conversation with herbs and the different plants that are out there is gut health. Yes. We get so uh, mundane in our diets. You know, we eat the same things that, and still in many cases, are laden with uh, pesticides and hormones and all these things that, you know, and not only that, it's everything else we put in our body that, you mm -hmm. know, really kind of uh, impacts our gut health. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I do a lot of, I get, so I get usually to get blood tests and those kind of things about every quarter, uh, cause I'm always trying something different, what my food sensitivities are. And yeah. I do know that, you know, having variety in your diet is huge, uh, for your body to be able to adapt and be able to extract because your body needs the diversity so it can feed your main brain that, mm -hmm. that uh, goes over. That's so right. that's, so I guess. Um, obviously with all these herbs, it's much more micro doses versus your, you know, main dishes, but right. is there a, I guess, is there a certain makeup of herbs or, you know, different, maybe different types of herbs, different families of herbs, mm. of plants that would be good to have in a diet? Yeah. Oh yeah. The first thing that comes to my mind as you were talking is, um, bitter herbs. So that's sort of, a. a 
a whole category of herbal medicine that is um, as old as it gets, right? I was just hearing the other day that like, as soon as we developed alcohol as a, as a human society, bitter herbs were utilized for digestion. So we think of these things as like aperitifs or, you know, just little drinks that um, probably are more popular in Europe, you know, than yeah, here. France. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so the whole idea is a digestive, you know, a, di a digestive uh -huh. aid yeah. and, yeah. and what bitter, it's, it's really just the bitter flavor profile that is the useful thing here. And plants, as I was mentioning before, tend to not taste very good. And, you know, bitter is sometimes the, the, the way that it moves towards. And so um, we as a, as a society, especially in the US, have tended away from bitter flavors. And so we, when we taste things that are bitter, we tend to just really snub our noses at it. But, you know, cucumbers and, um, you know, arugula and like all these vegetables that are supposed to be very bitter have sort of been bred to be just a little bit more watered down than mm -hmm. they originally were. And so we're just simply not getting that flavor profile and a way that we can reintroduce that as a medicinal property is that bitter flavor is through herbs. Herbs are a wonderful way to do that. And chamomile, by the way, is, you know, in, within that category of, or of bitter as well. Um, gentian is also within that category. So, so these things are um, medicinal towards the digestive tract in that way. And I'll tell you just briefly, you know, well, why? Why do we want a bitter flavor profile? It's because it activates our digestive system in many ways to process and digest food more completely, more fully. And it's only when we can process and digest food really, really well that we can absorb all of the nutrients that it that you know we're taking in in the in the form of food. So you know, bitters increase the acid production in our stomach. It produces more um, you know pancreatic enzymes and uh, and bile from the liver. It uh, creates more of a peristaltic like movement of our digestive tract. So, you know, it's really, really powerful. I prescribe them all the time to people with, um, with digestive issues. So now you got digestion and then you've got some of the, you know, big issue that most people don't realize is out there because it gets a little more micro into it is leaky gut. Mm -hmm. Leaky gut is a huge thing. Um, yeah. And a lot of it has to do with people eating too many foods that they're sensitive to and they don't realize they're sensitive to them. Mm -hmm. um in, in many cases uh but leaky gut then causes typically yeah. a leaky brain which is allowing you know too much junk basically getting into your blood system and up to your brain which creates fog and you know all the other things that come along with it uh is there any herbs that you know of that that might help for that and i said if anybody listening that you know, it doesn't know what i mean by that it's leaky gut is something you should definitely check out because most people don't know they have it i had it uh you know but i didn't yeah. know what i was getting a having my, you know, a blood test. And so right, you know, we right. go through it and, and, you know, we, we look at it quarterly and, you know, it's, it's, it's good to go. So yeah. uh, what kind of herbs, but is there any kind of herbs or plants out there that you know that help with that? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I think the, the plant that comes to my mind the most and one that people might actually have in their home is aloe. So, you know, we, we usually think about aloe as something that we may put on a burn or a cut yeah. to help it heal. Yeah. Um, but if you really think about it, our, our in side lining of our digestive tract is really just a continuation of our skin. You know, it's yeah. not skin, of course, um, but it's, you know, kind of technically open, right, to the outside yeah. world. And yeah. so it's uh, it's a mucous membrane. That's what it's called. And so uh, it needs to be healed sometimes. And so after I go through the process with people of uh, eliminating those foods that you're talking about, finding out what else might be contributing to leaky gut, we have to figure out what's causing it first. But once you do that, um, herbs such as aloe, um, can the gel of the inner yeah, aloe yeah. leaf is what not, I'm talking about. Not the about spiky here. part, not the hard spiky part. Yeah. yeah you don't just want to like <laughs> chew on it. <laughs> you don't just want to grab a piece and chew on it. Cause, um, you'll probably get a lot of diarrhea if you do that, by the way. So definitely don't do that. Uh, you know, squeeze out the middle, the gel only, and, and you can, you can take that, you can eat that. And, um, it can be very healing for your digestive tract. It also comes, you know, you can also purchase aloe gel, of course, if you want to make yeah. this a more legitimate thing, uh, that you do in your daily life. But that's one, that's one of the 
main components that I that I use in my gut healing protocol is aloe. And so there, and this is where you know most people know aloe and they think of it again for burns. when I was a kid, I got right. burned, my, my you know mother used to you know, break off a little bit, squeeze a little bit, and and say it'll be better. Um, but mm-hmm. there's so many different uses, and we literally step on plants all day long and brush against plants and drive by plants that. You know, I'm always, so one of the thoughts I have when I, you know, when I go, if I go for a walk and I'm walking through the woods and I'm like, how many plants around me right now can I eat or can (laughs) I use, or can I do something that's going to do something with that's going to be able to help an ailment, be able to help something that I don't know that's going on. I mean, so I guess, uh, I guess that's kind of another good twist here is if somebody's walking through these Missouri woods, Mm, mm. what are a couple of things that people might come across? Oh my God. I love uh, maybe, this maybe, it's, maybe it's a tree. Maybe it's a bush. Maybe it's a grass. Maybe it's a, you know, again, a, a, a uh, <laughs> people consider a weed. Uh, what are some things out there that you think, um, you know, people might not know that they could use? I love this question so much because there's so many things. We're so lucky here in Missouri to have lots and lots of good um, plant allies at our fingertips, just in the hikes that we do. Um, so the very first thing that came to my mind was nettles. Do you know about nettles? I, I, I know, I know the plant, but I don't know. I don't not, I'm not familiar with what it can do for you. Okay. So they, you know, they typically grow, like if you're going to go looking for them, they typically grow very close to water. So you need to find, you know, somewhere where there's a Creek bed, you know, running through it, low land, um, you know, more moist areas and, uh, spring. So early spring, Uh, is when you're, you're really going to see those nice big nettle leaves Mm -hmm. leaves come up. And the the crazy thing about nettles is that if you touch them, they actually sting you. They're called stinging nettles. Um, And so you have to wear gloves when you, if you're going to go harvesting for them. So you just turned off a bunch of people. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, and, and it's amazing what plants evolve to protect themselves, right? Yeah, like yeah, it's exactly. pretty cool. Um, we all do it. We evolved to protect ourselves in different ways. And that's one that they've chosen to do. You actually, it's not like super painful. Like if you think it's deactivated really quickly. So, you know, the real uh, heroes among us, they might just grab it and smush it up with their hands and then it doesn't sting at all because yeah, they're like deactivating yeah. it while they do it. But really, you know, if you want to pick a lot of them, you need some gloves. And then as soon as you cook them, or as soon as you, you know, break them up, maybe squish them around in the bag, that stuff's deactivated. And it's, it's really not um, awful. It's not like, you know, big spikes or anything yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you can cook the nettles. Um, you know, they come, they come in, you know, if you go to your supplement store, they're freeze dried and encapsulated. And I'll tell you, they're very, very helpful for allergies. So seasonal allergies. Um, uh, and then there's, there's great recipes online. Nettle pesto is, is what I've done with them before and how I, now you're talking my language. There yeah. We go. <laughs> yeah. So you, you, just, you, know, you put a bunch of olive oil and some, um, you could even add some extra basil in there if you wanted to get that basil component to your pine nuts and your Parmesan cheese. And it's just delicious. Uh, you, you hit all my, all my main food groups. There. I said, excellent. There you go. Oh, well, yeah. Okay. Some, oh yeah. Trees. Go, go there any, any, yeah. Any, yes. Let's talk about trees. Yeah. So let's see trees. Um, well, there's, there's some really great, um, I mean, elderberry is not really a tree, but we can talk about elderberry just because it's so, I think probably on a lot of people's minds, like when they think of, uh, walking around, picking out their, you know, medicine, especially with, the, you know, viruses and whatnot going around. Um, Elderberry is a really versatile plant because you can use the berries for syrup and for um, increasing the immune system's ability to fight off colds and flus. And then uh, you can also use the elder flower for, um, you know, fever. So when you're actually sick and not feeling so good, you, know, you can use that in a tea to help with fever. So those are plants that are rich in abundance for medicinal properties, for sure. Huh. So, I mean, I know, uh, obviously persimmon is a more of a, you know, a fruiting tree out here. And I remember I tried eating one when it was a little too, uh, green still. Yeah. It's got like real, like cotton. Mouth. Oh, it's awful. <laughs> I've had I've done that before too, with one that wasn't even, too like early it was just it just was terrible persimmon's one of my favorite fruits 
when it's good, but when it's bad, it is so bad. Yeah, yeah. Because I remember my my grandfather. I love my grandfather. You see, because I don't really. Oh, why don't I just put my mouth? <laughs> oh yeah, no, it's awful. You can't even get rid of it. <laughs> so, um, I guess what are some of the um, ailments or illnesses or things that are most common that you would might have a might prescribe uh, or might have a protocol for whether it's the flu or maybe you know, I mean we were talking a lot, a lot about seasonal allergies mm-hmm. uh, but what are some what are some of the common things that, that you prescribe for for some of these things so so as far as what I see in my practice uh, like you know what type of things people walk in with that want help with lots of digestive issues. And, um, you know, we've talked about bitters already, but, you know, if uh, I'll give you an example, if someone has, I'll give you more ex- sort of extreme example. Um, yeah. I don't know if this is what you, what you're wanting, but uh, yeah, it's anyway. just, it's just kind of useful to know what herbs can do. This isn't necessarily what you can do out of your own backyard, but, yeah. um, you know, if someone has, you know, food poisoning or some, some really bad, you know, issues, symptoms of food poisoning. Um, we all know what I'm talking about. You know, you you can use herbs to just, they're called astringents, you know, things that are really going to tighten up the tissues, um, in your digestive tract to help stop, you know, all that water from, from Mm -hmm. coming into the digestive tract. Um, and so, you know, more acute things like that, you know, certainly herbal medicine can be, can be utilized for. So, Um, but that's more of an acute thing. I see people of all kinds. So even high blood pressure, you know, we can talk about the more chronic diseases, high blood pressure and diabetes and things being useful, um, for those as well. Um, one of my favorites, and I guess talking about trees, you know, you asked me about trees before, I don't know if they grow here in Missouri, but, um, the Hawthorne tree, you probably could grow it as a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, Crataegus is like the Latin name um, or Hawthorne berries are very medicinal. They, they help lower blood pressure. Um, you know, if we're talking about from more of like an energetic spiritual standpoint, they're really heart focused. So someone who has just a heavy heart, a broken heart, um, you know, maybe cardiovascular issues that are more um, emotionally centered and heart centered, you know, that's of who I, that's who I think about Cretagus and Hawthorne berries for. Um, that, that, that's interesting. So, uh, autoimmune disease is, you know, the catch all for when yeah. nobody knows what's going on Yeah, uh, in a lot of cases. And uh, I've got friends um, that have, you know, relatives that are in the medical profession, stuff like that. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I'm always, you know, always talking about well, autoimmune this and autoimmune that. And I'm like, well, I mean, how do you not know? You, you know, there's an issue, but how do you not know? And everybody wants to solve the problem with, you know, it with a with a pill or something that's just made up by us humans. Yeah. And again, that's part of it is when I go out in the woods, I'm like, come on, there's really there's there's just the pill that has to work. It may not be <laughs> as, you know, there might the natural stuff might not be as potent in many cases, but you know, always start with the easiest. Um, so mm. have you seen any autoimmune diseases or, or anybody that might be um, uh, diagnosed with an autoimmune disease that you, you've been able to help with any of the natural medicines that are out there? Again, maybe it is some of the, some of these same, these easy things that you're mentioning, but have you seen that before? Yeah, I see a lot of people with autoimmunity for sure. Um, you know, I think you really hit the nail on the head with just why don't we know like more about this? You know, there has to be some, some, you know, easier answer. And I think that there probably is, but we just, we just don't know exactly what it is right now. And, you know, what creates autoimmunity and uh, how do we help it? So when I see someone with an autoimmune condition, which is a lot, you, you can't just label it as autoimmune and then give them a thing for it. Cause that's what the conventional model does. Oh, you have lupus or, oh, you have, you know, this issue. Well, let's try a round of steroids or let's try this thing that just totally dampens your immune system down uh, to nothing. Right. And that may be useful for some people in certain situations, but um, what I like to do is really try to figure out why someone may have developed that in the first place. And it's not always possible to do, we can't always figure it out. But, um, you know, sometimes it's like a, 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 an illness that happens that triggers it. So like a viral illness often is um, underlying what triggers someone's autoimmune reaction to, to occur. 
Um, and so we might go after that, or, you know, we may go back to that leaky gut idea and just try to figure out in general how to keep someone's immune system um, at bay. And so there's, there's different, um, different ways to do that. So yeah, I see a lot of that in my practice. I guess so one of my, one of my last questions, and then and and let's see if there's anything I'm missing. So another thing that I always think about, I kind of, I kind of smirk is hmm. when I'm walking through the woods is how many people had to, had to you know, keel over before we found out that this was bad or this was good. I think about that all the time also. <laughs> yeah, how many thousands, tens of thousands of years, you know? And so is, is there a, like you've met, at the very beginning, you mentioned some families of plants that, uh, you know, plants in this family are usually really mm. good for next. But like, is there any general rules of thumb out there for like, okay, well, but just from the, from the get-go, if it has this kind of bark or if it has oh. this kind of flower or leaf, right? Is there anything like that that's out there just as a, like, a, like, a, like a catch-all, even though it might be catching some of the good stuff, but just kind of a rule of thumb? You know, that's a really good question. Um, oh, that's such a good question. I, I think that probably if we're just going on like just the basic beginning, like let's just make sure we're not eating anything that's bad. You know, you, if you don't know what a berry is, don't eat it because it's probably, it's probably not good. <laughs> so anything with like those bright colors, um, you know, you, you would want to maybe stay away from until you know what it is. So, you know, mushrooms that are super bright colored or, um, plants that have really bright colored, you know, red berries or purple berries, you know, those things, you know, we have to think about again, the evolution of plants and why they look the way they do, right. Uh They're saying, Hey, come eat me because I'm going to kill you. And then you won't eat me anymore. (laughs) Like, (laughs) you know uh so they're just trying to sort of protect themselves that's one of the reasons the plant might be colorful of course there's other reasons like attracting birds and bees but you know um as far as far as that goes like fruiting things you just generally want to stay away from because they may not be so good for you it's it's very interesting because most people don't understand that plants evolve oh it's just it's an it's an oak tree it's uh you know it's it's this it's that like well you know how many versions of that is oh i thought uh elderberry was an elderberry no, <laughs> there's a um, lot of varieties. There's a lot of changes, um, whether it's human intervention or it's just naturally ha- occurring. I, that's I, that's right. a good question. Is what um, plants that are being cultivated now for you know their low compact type form or uh, robust flowering or mm-hmm. or fruiting, like the elderberry, for example. There's a lot of new cultivars of that out that you know, whether they're genetically modified or they've been mm-hmm. uh, bred that way. Is yeah. there any disadvantages or advantages to either of those? Or is it is an elderberry Ooh. an elderberry? It doesn't matter. No, elderberry is not an elderberry. It doesn't matter. And so there's very specific um, species of each of, of plants uh, that you really, you know, can kind of count on to give you the medicinal property that you want. So um, I'll give you just, I guess, an, a, a brief example of what I'm talking about. So like a viburnum, you know, mm-hmm. uh, is a beautiful plant that I think a lot of people use for, yep. Yep. for use, gardens. The semi evergreens a lot. Yep. Yep. So, so I'm not so much in the garden world, but more in the, you know, medicinal plant yep. world. So I was shopping for, you know, I got a new house earlier this year and I was shopping for my garden and I saw a viburnum and I was like freaking out. So I was like, oh my gosh, a viburnum, you know, this is great. And, uh, what I was really wanting was a viburnum opulus because that's what cramp bark is. That's what I use for people who have severe menstrual cramps or who have, you know, really, really severe cramping of, of all, all kinds of sorts, but you can't use just any viburnum for that. It has to be this, this specific one that's called cramp bark. And so, um, yeah, to answer your question, it does matter. And I guess, you know, I shouldn't act like I know everything. It's not to say that maybe there's not a, a species um, that would also be useful, maybe one that I found at a garden store or something, but it just hasn't been researched. We don't have yeah. the knowledge about it. We don't have the understanding to know that that one is as useful. Um, and then I'll give you another example. So um, let's see, there's, so like with that echinacea, for example, there's echinacea purpura, there's echinacea angustifolia, you know, and then others. And each one kind of, you can look at the different profiles um, yeah 
for each one. And then there's a lot of examples of that. So there's some herbs that there's a couple of different ones and one might be used for one thing and one might be used for the other or even different parts of herbs so like i already said that before so the flowers yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's pretty specific you really have to kind of know exactly what you're doing it's 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 a it's a fascinating world i mean this is such a for all that encompasses this is such a brief like not even scratch the surface of everything that it entails Uh, it's quite amazing and i think if anybody listening or watching um has any interest in this is definitely worth checking out because if anything else it's you know, if you got kids it's fun to kind of experiment have a little fun with and go out in the garden and see oh, yeah. these things because we're not we're not brought up anymore to interact with nature and the yard and i mean we take care of our yard but actually know what everything does right. uh we had a whole podcast on um on soils and natural uh remedies for getting rid of weeds and, uh, you know, having weeds in the yard is indicative of, you know, poor soil and, mm. you know, soil nutrients. And so it's all these different kinds of things that, that I think we just, we just aren't, we're just not in our bringing up and our upbringing anymore. So that's great. if people want to find out more about you, where can they go? Yeah, people could visit my website. That would be probably the easiest way to get any information that they're curious about. So it's just my name, emilyhudson.com. And it's got contact info. It's got lots of info about what I do and, you know, the types of services that I offer. And um, yeah, just kind of scheduling. If you want to book an appointment, you can use I don't think you can book a new appointment through the website, but um, if you want to book a new appointment, you can just call the office and we will get you set up and always happy to chat with people um, just for, you know, brief phone calls beforehand, if they just kind of need to see if, if this is a good fit for them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, people are just used to normal, you know, medical field. I mean, this is a little bit different, but it's, it's an option that I think a lot of people just don't know that's there. And for a lot of people, it's, a good option. That's so. right. For a lot of people, it is a good option. And for some people, they're they don't need it, right? It's yep. and, and it's really just an individual thing. And I never uh never claim to be the owner, you know, of someone else's uh, understanding what somebody needs. Um, and so it's I don't see this as a distinct, you know, you know, separation from conventional mm-hmm. care. It's just it's all kind of a synergistic thing, and I uh, just really 100%. like to complement. Yeah. Um, the care that people likely are already are receiving. Maybe they just feel like they're kind of at the end of the line or they're, you know, they've been um, just kind of at, yeah, at the end of the rope with what they can get from the conventional model for whatever reason. Do you have any social media or anything that people can follow you? Yeah, I have five Instagram. Okay. Um, I believe my Instagram handle is just Dr. Emily Hudson ND. Let's see. Oh, I should have been prepared for this. Sorry. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's know. Dr. Emily Hudson ND is my Instagram handle. Um, and then I have a Facebook too. So it's just the same thing, but I, I'd say probably I'm more active on Instagram. Than I'm, I'm, the, I'm the same. Yeah. But it's, it's, I mean, I always encourage people to reach out sometimes a lot of places like, you know, people uh, with different things, I'll reach out to them on Instagram before I'll book an appointment or something like right. that. It's a little bit more, you know, relaxed. Oh yeah. Yeah. So. It's just easy. And then I guess uh, you have anything else you would like to add? Something maybe I glossed over that you oh, that you were pressing that you want to jump on? You know, I feel like we talked about so much today. I love talking about herbs. I love talking about herbal medicine. I'm sure I'll think of lots of things that we that we didn't talk about as soon as we end the video today. But um, well, write I guess, them down you know, because I'd love to have I'd love to have you on again. Yeah, you know, I think the only thing that I was thinking um, I wanted to mention today, because uh, of one of your really good prompts that you sent over to me was just like, how can people use plants, you know, and I just was really reflecting on that a lot. And it doesn't have to even be internally, you know, digesting them or taking them. Um, you know, there's been study after study talking about just the beneficial uh, act of cultivating and being around um plants around nature. And so I think with the pandemic and everything going on, people have really gone back to their roots, pun intended, to yeah. like be surrounded by nature and as, you know, in the best way that they can because they're just simply not getting outside. So all these house plants that we're cultivating, I really think are 
helping our mental health because we're growing these things, you know, we're making these things um, and nurturing them. And that is absolutely doing a wonder for our health and our, our mental health as well. It's so. been a huge, huge boom in our, in our, just our retail business, all yeah. the house plants and the warehouse plants and Forbes last year had an article about, you know, uh, you mm -hmm. know, plants and the value of them. It's just like, I was like, Oh my gosh. And then just this NASA study I'm seeing everywhere that wasn't even done anytime recently. It was yeah. like, long time ago, but it's just this huge resurgence of this NASA study that was done talking about the top, whatever, 10, 20 something plants yep. that clean our air, you know, the, 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 I don't even remember the ivies, you know, the thing, the yeah, vacuas, the ivies, you know, just the, the coleus is like all these things. So, you know, just having them around are going to help purify our air as well. Santa Severia. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, have, have you just real fast, have you, have you uh, seen, the study by Texas A and M, um, Charlie Hall was one of the was part of this. It was um, mm -hmm. the health and benefits are uh, the benefits of plants. It goes into the the health, the economic, and the environmental well being of plants, and it goes through you know the decrease in people mm -hmm. returning to prison, the decrease in the time in hospitals, uh, the calming effect it has for people driving, like people have less road rage. I mean, it's all this crazy stuff. Uh, and these are like, like, there's like several studies to back up. I each love point. that. So if you're, if you're, if you should, you should be able to Google Texas A&M, okay. uh, uh, the benefit of plants. And I, I think you get a kick out of it. I love that they're studying that. That makes me so happy. And this is a few years ago. This is recent. This is a few years ago also. So it's, it's awesome to see. That's well, great. Emily, thank you so much for making the time. I do look forward to doing another one of these with you. So definitely anything that comes up after this, definitely write it down. Okay. Uh, I'm I will. All, all about getting, and for anybody listening uh, and watching, uh, please like, subscribe, share. Uh, we appreciate your ears. This is a show that we it really means something to us because we want you to be successful in your yards to think of your landscaping, your gardening, uh, all this stuff in different ways uh, and how it can be meaningful to you in different ways besides just having a pretty house and a pretty yard. So uh, feel free to reach out to us on social media at Frisella Nursery. I am at Tony Frisella, Tony Frisella on Instagram. And uh, until then, look forward to uh, having your ears next week. Thank you.